So, husband wakes up on Sunday morning. Wife wakes him, shakes him, goes, honey, you need to get up. Need to get ready for church. Man grabs the blanket, pulls it over his head, says, I don't want to go. She goes, give me three reasons why you don't want to go to church. He goes, number one, the sermons are not that great. Number two, I don't feel like it. Number three, that church, those people don't even like me. And she grabbed him and got face to face with him and said, can I now give you three reasons why you're going to church? She said, number one, the sermons. They are what they are. Two, it doesn't matter how you feel. It's the right thing to do. Number three, you're the pastor. Let's go. (laughs) Today, I'm starting a new series that I don't know how excited about I really am to bring it. It's a word that I feel like God has been laying on my heart, but you know you've got certain sermons that you do, and you're just excited about it, and all the people are going to join in, and we're going to walk out of here just celebrating God, and then there are sermons like this one. (laughs) Those of y'all that are visitors for your first day, you're like, really, today's the day? Hmm. But this is a series, this is a a sermon topic, kind of like that one pastor of like, ah, I don't know how excited I am about bringing this, but I know this. I know that it's truth, and I know that I'm supposed to bring truth, and I know there's going to be times that I'll bring messages, and we'll all celebrate and high-five and go, what an awesome God we serve. But my prayer is this. My prayer is that we'll take even the difficult words, and we'll still look up and say, what an awesome God we have. So today, I got two passages I want to take you to, all right? Two places inside of the Word of God that I want you to go to. So take out your Bibles. You guys got your Bibles with you? Hold those up. Hold those up real quick. All across the room. Good. You got it in the back, Bubba? Good. Way to be there, guy. All right. Turn over. Two places. Ah, Both of them in the Old Testament. One, I want to take you to the book of Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah chapter 43. Go to Psalms. Take a right. You're going to hit it. Isaiah chapter 43, and then I also want you to go to Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. Those are the two places I want to take you to. So, what are we talking about? (laughs) We're going to talk about suffering. Oh, wow, and the people said amen. (laughs) We're going to talk about this. We're going to talk about pain, and we're going to talk about suffering. Because first off, every single one of us in this room have gone through pain and suffering. Some are in the midst of it right now. Maybe you've got family members who are over in the Florida area after that devastation. I've got friends who literally are there. Uh, In fact, I was supposed to leave today after church to go to Fort Myers to spend time with some of these pastors that are in that area. So they are going through suffering right now. But every single person in this room, every junior high girl, every uh, uh, adult in this place, we've all gone through suffering. So here's the deal. The Bible says it is part of life. Part of, in fact, do you know this? The King James Version Bible is going to talk about suffering 145 different times. So here's the deal. Here's, here's where I'm at. If we've got to experience suffering, let's do it right. Let's look at God and say, okay, God, if suffering is going to be, if pain is going to be a part of life, then God, what do you have to say on this topic? Because if I've got to go through pain and suffering, then you know what? I want to go ahead and do this thing right. The truth is, is that we want to run from pain. I mean, there's nobody in this room that's really going, oh, pain, sign me up. Scott, this sermon series, been waiting for this cowboy. No. <laughs> None of us like the idea. In, in fact, tell me how much time and energy we spend avoiding it. Our goal, tell me if I'm missing this, our goal seems to be comfort. We're drawn to comfort. What, Scott, talk to me about comfort today. That's a good message. Scott, what does the scripture say about, what, about joy? Can you talk about that? We spend so much time trying to get to comfort because what we're ultimately trying to do is we're trying to avoid pain. But pain is going to be part of life. So let me give you a good word here. 
You got to go through the bad stuff to get to the good stuff. And there's your tweetable moment for today. You got to go through the pain to be able to get to the joy and the greater things of God. It's part of it. A couple of years ago, I was diagnosed with cancer and um, had to go through some different surgery procedure. And I had this one time, I um, was there in the hospital, and I had to go through a very painful procedure. And first nurse came in, he said, we got to do this procedure, we've got to do this now, there's no time to <laughs> get you drugged up or anything, we, we've got to do this now. And, and it was painful. Fifteen minutes later, he came back and said, I'm sorry, but we're going to have to do this again. Twenty minutes after that, the doctor then comes in and says, we're going to have to do this a third time. Doctor comes over to me, and this, point, this is the point I grabbed the doctor, and I said, I just got to know one thing. Is there any other way? And I remember him just looking at me going, there's no other way. Jesus spoke the same thing, same sentence. Jesus knew that there was going to be redemption for you and me. He knew that there was going to be a bridge built between sinful man and holy God. He knew that that was coming. The scripture says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Can I tell you this real quick? Do you know what that joy was? That was you. You were the joy for the joy set before him. He saw you. He knew you. He knew your name. He knew your story because of, he knew you. And for the joy set before him, you, Amen. he endured the cross. But he knew that cross was real, and he knew that cross was coming. And in fact, he, Jesus, our example, amen, our example, right, our example, Jesus looked at God and said, is there another way? If this cup can pass before me, can, can we have the end result without going through this pain? And my friends, can I say this real quick? If there was ever a time for God to reveal that there were other ways to salvation than Jesus, don't you think right then would have been a great moment for God to say something? Would that not have been the point for God to be able to go, oh, wait a minute, dude, my bad. We're going to do it through this fat guy named Buddha, too. He's going to be another way to salvation. Hey, we're going to do it through Scientology. Hey, oh, Jesus, I can't even, whoo, slipped my mind. We're going to do it through this guy named Maha. No, Jesus said he is the way, the truth, and the life. No man could come to the Father but by him. But the only way that Jesus was going to get you and me to be able to have the right to come before him is to be able to go to the cross. Nobody likes the pain. Jesus didn't like the pain. But for the joy set before him, he endured. So we, we see Jesus saying the same thing. So let me bring this good news. We're going to do the short series on suffering. So if we got to start, let me start with good news. Let me, let me start with something to encourage us as we continue diving into this series. And it's simply this. God is with you in it. And he's going to take you through it. If you don't grab anything else today, will you grab that? God is in it. And God will take you through it. First passage, chapter, uh, Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah chapter 43, look at verse 2. When you pass through, somebody say through. through. When you pass through. Through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through, somebody say through. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through, somebody say through. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. Can somebody, man, just celebrate God for that word through? Because simply this, I want you to hear this. He's saying we're not staying there. 
Man, let me bring you good news about suffering. Let me bring you good news about pain. It's a season. I will take you through. I'll take you through the waters. I'll take you through the flames. It was Winston Churchill who said, if you find yourself in hell, keep walking. It's a season. So Jesus gives us these words, and we we read this in Isaiah. Now, in the midst, he's going to take you through. And in the midst, he's going to be with you. If you would, flip over to your other passage in um, in Daniel chapter chapter 3. And in Daniel chapter 3... Those of y'all that know this, this story is the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. All right? Parents, if you've not told your kids this story, man, you need to sharpen up on it because this is just an incredible story. There's so much in the story. Grandparents, if you haven't started telling your grandchildren the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, what an incredible story, incredible principles. So while you're flipping over or <laughs> to Daniel chapter 3 or whether you're trying, still trying to find Daniel, um, Chapter 3 is going to start off with this. It's going to start off with a king who's the king of Babylon, and his name is Nebuchadnezzar, right? Nebuchadnezzar is the king. If you remember the statue, he's the golden head. But Nebuchadnezzar is the king of Babylon, and what he has done is he goes to these other cities, he defeats these cities, he annihilates them, and then he brings all the people back into his city to work as slaves, right? So what the king has done, the king has created a statue in his honor. In fact, the scripture tells us this. The scripture tells us how big this statue is. It is 60 cubits tall by six cubits wide. I know some of you are sitting there right now going, wow, what kind of ego? And others of you are sitting there going, what's a cubit? (laughs) 60 feet or 60 cubits would be 90 feet. So it's 90 feet tall, it's 9 feet wide. Now, some of y'all still don't have a good perspective of that. Years ago, I, I, I grew up riding motorcycles, right? Grew up riding motorcycles my whole life as a kid, and, and I had a season in my life where I didn't have a motorcycle. Finally, there got to be a time where I went, you know what, I think I want a motorcycle again, right? I prayed about it, I felt like God gave me peace because Renee said, okay. So that's why I had peace. So it's time to get a motorcycle. So I finally, I was looking, I was looking through all these magazines and stuff, and I finally found a motorcycle. I was living in Houston at the time. This motorcycle was in Dallas. And so I found the motorcycle I was looking for at the right price tag and everything. So I called the guy. I said, I'm sending you half this money. And I said, keep the bike there because I'm grabbing a flight today. I'm coming to pick the bike up. So I literally, man, paid him and half the money. I got a cheap flight. I flew over to Dallas. I went over to the bike. Oh, it's perfect. Get on this bike. Now, you got to keep in mind a couple of things. First off, I hadn't ridden in years. It had been a long time. I mean, even that bike was so wide when I got on it, I was like, I felt like I was doing Pilates. I was like, whoa, okay. I mean, I was getting stretched out. The second thing is, I'm a cruiser. Okay? People on motorcycles, they know what that means. That's the bike I ride. I'm not a crotch rocket kind of guy. Just not me. Tom Cruise, not me. Sorry. All right? I'm also not a chopper guy. Used to have one. But no, I'm not a chopper. I'm a cruiser. What does that mean? I drive the neighborhood. That's what a cruiser does. I'm not one of those guys that are going, hey, let's pack up and head to New Mexico. No! I'm the guy going, hey, let's pack up and go to Papacitas. I mean, that's about it. So I hadn't ridden bikes in a long time, and then the other thing is, I get on this bike, and I'm going to drive from Dallas to Houston, right? And I don't have a big fairing on this bike, no. It's just a cruiser. Now, as you drive that drive from Dallas to Houston, I finally got to a spot that I was so happy to see. How many of y'all know where Big Sam is? Okay. Okay. On 45, right there in Huntsville, there is this huge statue of Sam Houston. And can I tell you, when I was on that motorcycle and I was driving, I was so glad. I'd been on that bike so long. I'd made so many pit stops at Dairy Queen. I was so glad, man, when I saw, oh, 
there it was. There was big sand. You know what that meant? That means you're close. You're close. Houston is close. You're in Huntsville. You're almost there. I was so glad to see. Now, let me throw this out to you. Put it in a little bit of perspective. There's Sam. Okay. Sam is 77 feet tall. The statue that we're talking about is another 13 feet taller than Sam Houston. And in fact, I think he's got like a 10-foot pedestal that he's got going on. So his total is 77. But when we're talking about this idol that King Nebuchadnezzar put up, it's 90 feet. It's taller than Big Sam. That puts it in perspective. Now here's what this egotistical king did. He goes... I put up this monument in my honor, and when you guys hear the music, when you hear the lyres and the flutes, when the band starts to play, I need everybody to bow down and worship me. Can I tell you something? That's what's taking place even today. The world is putting up its different idols, and it's saying you need to fall down, and you need to worship these different things in life that do not carry the name of Jesus. And the king said, if you do not, there's going to be consequences. You do not worship this idol when the music starts up. There's going to be consequences. In fact, what I'm going to do, i got a furnace over here, this cave. I'm going to get it lit up, and you're going to be thrown into this oven. Well, all of a sudden, the music starts up, and everybody begins to bow, except for a certain group of people called Hebrews who worshiped one other God named Jehovah God. And they wouldn't bow. And the king got a little perturbed with this because a bunch of rats kind of ran to the king and said, hey, do you know Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? They didn't bow. They didn't worship. Man, you got to throw them into the furnace. And so King Nebuchadnezzar goes, oh, you know why? Because King Nebuchadnezzar loved these guys. I'm going to explain to you why he loved them here in just a minute. But he loved these guys. And these three come in. He's like, oh, I don't want to do this, but i got to do it. Guys, y'all know the rules. When the music starts up, everybody's got to bow. And so listen, listen, listen. Let me just do this again. Let me give you another chance. Maybe you guys, it was a bad day. You got allergies. You couldn't hear very well. Okay, I'm going to play it again. I'm going to play the music again. This time... You worship, okay? Just bow down right there. We'll be fine. One, two, three. The music starts up. And in fact, in the next couple of weeks, we're going to dive in a little bit more into Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as we talk about suffering because there's some incredible stuff in there. But here's where I want to go today. They start up the music. They wouldn't worship. Now look at your passage in Daniel chapter 3, verse 19. The Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude toward them changed, right? He had that attitude of, dude, I love these guys. There's something about these guys. I can't put my finger on it, but there's something different about these Hebrew children. Can I tell you something? There is something different. Whoa, there is something different about you. You carry the anointing of God. You are sons. You are daughters of the Most High God. You carry something on you. Nebuchadnezzar, his attitude changed because he's going, I like these guys, but I, ah, I can't believe they're not doing what I tell them to do. The scripture goes on and says this. It says that his, his attitude, it changed. He ordered the furnace heated up seven times hotter than usual. And he commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound, and they were thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's uh, command was so urgent, and the furnace was so hot, listen to this, that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the furnace. Verse 24. Oh, you need to grab this. You got a Bible, man. You need to underline this right here. Then King Nebuchadnezzar, he leaped to his feet in amazement, and he asked his advisors, weren't there three men that were tied up and thrown into the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. Verse 25. He said, look, I see Four men walking around in the fire. 
unbound and unharmed. And the fourth, are you ready for this? Look at this. And the fourth looks like a son of the gods. What's the story, just real quick, just real quick. What's the story with the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego guys? See, here, here's what it was. They were Hebrews, and they lived in Jerusalem. They lived there in Jerusalem, and they worshiped inside of the temple. They worshiped Jehovah God. But when King Nebuchadnezzar, who um, ruled in Babylon, they came over, they just annihilated Jerusalem. And what they did was they took all the people out of Jerusalem, and they brought them back to Babylon, and they made them slaves. But keep in mind this. If you were just kind of average Joe, guess what? You're, you're making bricks, all right? You're making bricks and you're building buildings for the rest of your life. You're out there. But what the king was smart enough to do and he picked up on was he saw that there was something different about certain Israelites. And what he did with them was he brought them, he brought them into the palace. These would be the guys that would be servants for the kings. These were the guys that just looked sharper. These are the guys, man, that mentally, man, were just on it. These were good looking people. He separated them out and even changed their names. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is not their Hebrew names, that was their Babylonian names. But the king saw something different about them. He realized there was something different. Two weeks ago, a friend of mine came in out of town that I hadn't seen in years. And we went to go grab something to eat. We're at a restaurant, and we're just, we're just catching up, right? We're talking about our family. We're talking about work. We're, we're just catching up. And a waitress comes over. She's not even our waitress, just a waitress. She walks up, and she's kind of bashful, and she goes, she looks at me, and she goes, can I ask you something? I said, sure. She goes, are you a pastor? Now, immediately, I looked down. I was like, is there a name badge? Am I wearing a prayer lanyard? You know, am I dressed really bad with an 80s, you know, 70s tie or something? I didn't know. But she looked at me and just goes, are you a pastor? I didn't know this girl. She's never been to church here. She's not even from this area. But there was something that was different. She, she, she went and went, there's something. I can't put my finger on it, but there's something different here. Can I tell you something? On Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, there was something different. On, can, can I speak this over you? There's something different on you. There's something different on you. Now, do I have that happen to me all the time? No, I don't have that. You know, sir, do you know how fast you are going? Oh, there's something different about it. No, it doesn't happen. No. <laughs> but can I tell you something? As sons and daughters of God, Jesus says this about you. <laughs> I love this. He goes, you are a peculiar people. And I remember the very first time I heard that verse, I went, we're weird? No, no, no. He's saying you're different. You're set apart. And as sons and daughters of God, there is a different anointing that is on you. Enemy doesn't want you to know it. God does. And I'll tell you this, the enemy knows it too. If you remember when Jesus came walking up and there was the demon-possessed man, do you all remember this? The pigs jump off the cliff, right? Jesus walks up. He doesn't have to walk up, hand a card. Hi, Jesus Christ, good to meet you. Look at my social media. No, he walks up, and before he says a word, the demons walk up and say, dude, what are you doing here? We know who you are. There's something different about our God. Can I tell you this? There's something different on you. There's something different on you. So we got Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they're saying, hey, king, this isn't going to happen. We are not going to do this. And so they, and, and so talking about the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, how he took them out of Jerusalem, here's what I want you to see. You can take somebody out of a location. Don't allow them to take the Lord. The Lord's not going to budge. It's the same God. Maybe, maybe you've moved. Maybe you're here today. You moved here from Portland. You came here from L.A. You came from California. Whatever the case may be. Can I tell you something? You may change locations, but don't change lords. 
Wherever you go, God's there. But Scott, I'm, I'm starting a new school, and I'm kind of freaked out. And, okay, so tell me about your old school. Was God at your old school? Oh, yeah, we had Bible study. And, and man, I, I knew God was with me. Can I tell you something? God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. You, just because you change schools doesn't mean you change God's. Just because you change your job doesn't mean that you've changed your, your, your Messiah. My friends, Paul would say this. Paul, in, in his greeting in the book of Philippians, he's going to say this. He says, to all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi. Hold on. There's something beautiful right there. To all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi. See, it does, can I say this in love? It doesn't matter where you're at. It totally matters that you're in Christ. So if he's changed your job, he's changed your home, he's changed your school, God has not changed. And that same God, my friends, that that same God is working with you. So they were taken out of their homes, but God was not taken out of them. Did you grab that? They were taken, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were taken out of their homes, but God was not taken out of them. Now, that's why I, um, I kind of laugh sometimes when, when people will end, uh, normally a church service, and they'll end with this prayer, this little prayer clip, Lord, go with us as we leave this place. I kind of chuckle, and I wonder if God does too. When we pray that prayer, Lord, go with us as we leave this place, right? Like God's going, oh, can I come with you guys? Because I was planning on staying here. I mean, house of God, you know. So I was planning on staying here. I know y'all were going to boo rays. I was just going to hang out here until next Sunday. No. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. In fact, can, can, I, I just need to do this. I need to remind you that God is saying, I haven't dissipated, I haven't evaporated, I haven't disappeared. Deuteronomy, if you're taking notes, man, just jot these down real quick. Deuteronomy 31.8 says this, it is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. Deuteronomy 31.6, be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them, for it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Uh, we're not done. Joshua 1.5, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. And I will not leave you or forsake you. Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. Joshua 1, 9. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. Why? The Lord, your God, is with you wherever you go. When I hear parents say, Scott, we need to get prayer back in school. I respond with, it's never left. As long as you have geometry exams, you're going to have prayer. So the reality is, is that God is speaking to us, and he's saying this even in the New Testament. New Testament, last one I'll give you, uh, Matthew 28, 20. And behold, I am with you to the end of the age. Can I ask you a question just real quick, real quick? We're, we're, we're going to wrap up here in a second. Can you remember the time that you were furthest from God? Can you remember it? Maybe it was after the divorce. Maybe it was during the affair. Maybe it was a time of rebellion, of being clueless of God. Well, when was the time that you were furthest? I can remember mine. I remember the rebellion. Oh, the hatred. 
that was inside of me, just the, 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 the heated rebellion that was the drugs, the alcohol abuse, the pornography. I just, I, I remember that time. Can you remember one of yours? When you were furthest from God. Psalm 139, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you are there. If I make my beds in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light will become night around me. Even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like day for darkness is as light to you. Can I tell you something? Even in my worst, worst rebellion, I knew he was there. I knew he was there. Now, he was bringing conviction. I mean, his one friend told me, he said, God's not going to even let you enjoy your sin. But in my worst, I knew he was there. And I speak that to you today. I speak that to you today. Even in my rebellion, I knew God was there. I knew that I could not run him. Back to um, the book of Daniel, verse 24, the Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement, and he asked his advisors, weren't there three men that were tied up and thrown into the fire? They replied, certainly, your, your majesty. He looked, and he said, look, I see a fourth man walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of God's In the midst of the flames, in the midst of the flames, it was in the midst of the flames that the fourth showed up. Can I, can I say this too, especially to those y'all that are going, you're in the flames right now. You're in the suffering. You're in the middle of the divorce. You're in the middle uh, of, of, of the bankruptcy taking place. You're in the middle of those cancer treatments, whatever it may be. Can I tell you this? It's in the middle of the flames that the fourth shows up. Now, I just got to tell you this. He's already there. But this is a reminder, this is a reminder that the fourth is there, that he is there in the midst of the storm. And you know why? You know why? Because the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Fear not, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. When they looked up, when the king looked up and saw a fourth man, he knew we put three in, right? One, two, three. Oh, no, thought three. We got three inside of here. I look in again. Four. And he looks like the phrase that we actually read in the Hebrew He looks like a son of the gods. You see, Nebuchadnezzar didn't have the words. He didn't didn't have the definition. He didn't have the verbiage to go, wait a minute. We put three in, there's a fourth. But is that a theophany? Is that a Christophany? He didn't have those words. You know what those are? A theophany means a presence, a physical presence of God. A Christophany is a physical presence of Jesus showing up before Bethlehem. That's what those are. You see, Nebuchadnezzar didn't have those words. He wasn't able to say. All he could say was, there's something different. There's something different about this fourth man that's in the fire. I I, I don't have the verbiage to say uh, what this is, but there's something supernatural. Can I tell you something? There are going to be times when the world looks at you and goes, there's something different about you. You carry an anointing that doesn't smell like the world. You carry, you carry an anointing in your workplace. 
you walk in an anointing with your family. Your family, for whatever reason, it just, there's something different about you guys. And it's not that you got 8,000 crosses in the house or footprints of Jesus on the front door, but there's something different about you. And when Nebuchadnezzar looked in there, he said, there's something different about that fourth one. But he also said this, he knew there was already something different about those boys. I'll tell you this. When I went through my cancer, and that very first day, right after a church service, I ran to an emergency room. And I'm laying there in that stupid paper dress. And when the doctor came in, after doing CAT scans and everything, he came in and it's just downcast face, just downcast. He said, Mr. Crenshaw, I'm, I'm sorry to tell you that uh, we found a mass. Can I tell you something? God was there. And in fact, right there, the moment he said that, we found a mass. Immediately in my spirit, I heard, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. He was there. A few years ago, I was in a shooting situation where I got held up and I got shot twice in the back of the head and once in the shoulder. And I can remember when I felt the gun barrel hit me in the back of the head right before the gun went off, before he pulled the trigger, I heard this still small voice go, you're not going to die. He was there. He was there. Can I remind you something today? In the Old Testament, one of the names for God is the name Jehovah Shema. You know what it means? God is there. God is there. And I speak this over every single one of you, whether you're in your school and you feel like you're the only Christian. God is there. His name is Jehovah Shema. As you sit here today and you feel like, I shouldn't even be in this place. There's all these people that are so much closer to God than me. Scott, I, I, I shouldn't even be in this place. Can I tell you something? He says to you, he whispers his name to you this morning. Your God is here. For the people going through the turmoil, the pain and suffering in Florida, his name is Jehovah Shema. The God is there. For every single person in this room, no matter what you're going through, can I remind you of his name one more time? His name is Jehovah Shema. The Lord is there. You bow your heads with me.